this is not what this is. You've actually got this really exciting. You're gonna be very excited because you haven't come to the recording of a show. You've come to the recording of the DVD extras. <laughs> oh, welcome to the blooper reel. <laughs> so uh, what happened was uh, Chris, who, who runs Go Faster, uh, he said, uh, "Will you do this uh, show? Uh, you're a really big name. It would be great to have a big name that will really draw a sold-out <laughs> crowd." Um, one of the reasons that I've stayed with Go Fast for so long is their level of delusion and <laughs> the failure of anyone else to ever ask. So, um, this, there is a bit of a ring on this. Is, uh, um, can I do it on this mic? Because it might be... Is that going to work if I'm just on this mic? Can I just so check? Oh, OK. Yeah, no, 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 that, that's fine. This, I, I really wanted to be Tony Law's fucking warm-up man for 90 <laughs> minutes. The... Um, <laughs> so what I'm going to do is, uh, when, when Chris asked me, I said, look, there was loads of stuff that we didn't manage to get filmed. So what we're going to do is I've made a list of 67 ideas <laughs> that we didn't manage to film. We have 90 minutes to do them in, maximum, as well as also some readings from some other books. And also, some of them, literally the only thing I remember about them are the three words that used to be on a little kind of prompt sheet in my head. So I haven't performed them for about a year year and a half. So a lot of this is going to be going, and then she... No. <laughs> I remember it being quite a punchy... Uh... Oh, that's disappointing. So uh, every now and again I will do it, as, uh, I'll slow down and uh, create a kind of, when there's actually really no punchline, I'll create a false sense of, of gravitas, um, like <laughs> Stuart Lee. <laughs> so, um... Ah. Anyway, so this is... Um... The, uh, I think I mentioned that, that, that just before I did the last, uh, my official last gig, uh, he did say to me this wonderful thing where we, we were doing a... Uh, in fact, we were recording something the other day. We were doing a return of the podcast, uh, Shambles podcast, that I used to do with Jeff, Joshy, Joshy, Joshy Long. And... Uh, Josie Long. And, uh, the, um, and Stuart once said to me, he said, uh, why do you talk about so many things? <laughs> why don't you talk about fewer things, but more thoroughly? <laughs> And I said, because I'm less confident than you, and you went, ah. <laughs> so, the first thing that I didn't manage to fit in to... Uh, th this is probably a weird story to start with, because it's, uh, we're filming this two in the afternoon on, on a Saturday. But uh, the Saturday's not so much about it. It's more the two in the afternoon element. And um, this was... Uh, well, I wanted to talk about... one of the, the, the show that we recorded here was a show that I did about kind of the mind and the brain stuff, and it was... Uh, um, and one of the things that inspired me was reading about a man called Roger Sperry. You might know about Roger Sperry. He's a, he was a neuroscientist. He won the Nobel Prize. And, and I was kind of... I had this experience where I, I had a brain scan and various other brain tests done entirely for fun, and it was brilliant, and I still do them. It's, it's great. Once you've been into an MRI three or four times for a scan, they just keep inviting you back, right? It takes ages to get them for free initially, but once they go, he really doesn't give a fuck about going in there. You know, I didn't feel no, no claustro. Just show it to me again. Brilliant, right? I really, and, and people go, oh, don't go in a brain scan. It's really scary. What, what if you find out something? And I think that would be all right, wouldn't it? You know, I've, I, I presume that every day is the day that I'm going to die. So <laughs> it's not going to, you know, actually then being given some kind of reason or purpose, um, such as a, a, a swelling or indeed a, that was what I worried about. I thought, what if I don't have a brain? I, I actually <laughs> thought, what if I? It's fine as long as I didn't know I didn't have a brain. I was able to operate as if I was a conscious being. But upon the act of observation and finding out I had no brain, then bleh, right? So I was scared about that. But the reason was Roger Sperry did this fascinating experiment where uh, he... There's a frog, right? There is a frog, which... There's more than one. Actually, I'm lying. There's a frog. You know, there's loads of different frogs, right? And uh, one of them... Uh, not just one of them, the whole group of these particular frogs. You can tell I haven't done this for a while. This is not... You know, when, I, when I'm on my Radio 4 science show, sometimes I actually... Well, I was going to say I sound authoritative. I don't. I'm sat next to Brian Cox. He sounds authoritative, but needs to be interrupted because they get confused by particle physics. And uh, so uh, there was this... Uh, th basically, what happens is it's an understanding of the hardwiring of the brain and it's also an understanding of the fact that we have brains which appear to have a certain amount of malleability that we're able to learn. So the frog, if a fly goes past it, and let's say that that is the line of the fly, that basically triggers the frog's tongue to go... Vudump, and catch the fly very effectively. But it's not a f looking at the fly and going, oh, that's you know, pretty feckish, I'll get that. 
It is the stimulation basically of that's the line, that is the, the kind of the arc of the fly, vudump, and that's how it works. And Roger Sperry thought, ah, but can a frog learn? The only way for me to find this out is by turning its eyes upside down, which is a very common thing that scientists very often will say, <laughs> how can we know more? We could turn its eyes upside down. It's not even got anything to do with the visual input that it has. Well, let's just turn them upside down. Now we've bought an eye spoon, we might as well use it, right? So they turn the frog, so, so it is now getting an upside down picture of the world, right? And what they found was the frog didn't learn. Every time a fly went like that, its tongue went vudum, right? <laughs> vudum, and it dies. So this is, you can't, even if you give it dead flies, and you go, it's all right, there's loads of dead flies, you go, throw it, it won't work unless you throw, oh, you can get the arc right. Yeah, that's, so I was thinking about what we have as human beings is we have uh, what is known as a long child. Childhood, right? The long childhood is... Uh, Charles Darwin talked about it, Jacob Ronofsky talks about it in The Ascent of Man. The long childhood is... Uh, well, when most animals are born, you will have seen through uh, all manner of nature documentaries, etc. Uh, I was going to say the work of David Attenborough, who... Uh, I met David Attenborough two years ago, and it was one of the best days of my life. It was my two best days are meeting David Attenborough and standing in the middle of the Lovell telescope. That's the best fucking thing, right? You know when you've... you've I was going to say, like, career plan. I've never had a career plan. But if I had had a career plan, the final part of it would be, and then you stand in the middle of the Lovell telescope, right? <laughs> so it turns out, in hindsight, I secretly had this, and it's the most amazing. You go up this kind of, it's, you got a lift first. You, you've all seen it, because you're Doctor Who fans. You've seen it in Legopolis, <laughs> obviously, right? Um, most of you take your science in through fictional methods from the late 1970s and early 80s. And, uh, and it is, but it's such a beautiful structure. You properly feel a real awe. I am not joking. When I, I've seen it many, many times, uh, and images, but two weeks ago, barely two weeks ago, turned a corner and there, Jodrell Bank, there, Lovell Telescope, it is one, it, it's, it's up there with the first time that I saw the Grand Canyon. There is a moment when you first see something like that and you just go, that, well, that's it. There's no words are not required, right? There is a moment of silence, which is rare for me. And, uh, <laughs> and we went up Jodrell Bank and you go up in a lift first of all, and then some of it's quite rusty. So about 80% of my group went, I oh, don't really trust the walkway, right? And it is beautiful and you go across this walkway and then you climb up this ladder and then suddenly you are in the middle of the dish and there is the antenna and there you realise all of the information that's been gathered from across the universe about pulsars and quasars, right? It is magnificent. So that that was an amazing experience. And uh, even, even, even Brian Cox, when he got in there, he a little smile, because he's not a cheery bloke. And uh, <laughs> but even, even he went, it's all right. And... Uh, <laughs> There. And um, so, but David Attenborough, when I met David Attenborough, what was, uh, and I had two weeks, two weeks of nightmares, because whenever I have to do things like that, meeting David Attenborough or going on just a minute, both of those things mean I can't sleep for a very long period of time. Just a minute, the first time I did just a minute, uh, which was, th there, there was Clement Freud, scared of Clement Freud. Obviously, you're meant to be scared of Clement Freud. That's, that's what he worked very hard on. And there was Paul Merton, and I think it was Ross Noble on that one. And I'd been dreaming. I had, I had just constantly, Every single night, I was dreaming of being in just a minute where and Nicholas would go, and now your subject is tea towels. And I'd go, uh, meh, meh, hesitation, look at the idiot, look at the idiot. And Paul Merton strips down just to his pants and starts dancing around me, priapic and proud. Anyway, so, I'm not even going to tell you stage two of that dream, but I had five, so it was pretty messy. And, um, but, and, and then I actually did, I, I, I got the, I can't remember what the first subject was, and I just wet my brain suddenly went, fire, everything, every single neuron, connection, connection, no, you can't have that, that's a repetition, throw that word away, that's fine, no one's even noticed. 43 seconds in with Paul Merton going, who is this young upstart? I might as well do my belt back up, right? <laughs> and it's just suddenly I, my brain goes, hey, use a sitcom reference. What did my brain deliver? A lower low. <laughs> you stupid bastard. <laughs> <laughs> 
Repetition. <laughs> anyway, so, <laughs> so we're, we're still not on idea one, and the uh, <laughs> this is uh, so that my fear when I met David Attenborough was it's kind of linked to Nicholas Parsons is because David Attenborough, is, you know, at that point he was I think eighty seven years old, and and he's incredibly strong. I mean, he is. You know, it, it's a bit like when I shook the hand of Chris Hadfield, the astronaut, right? And and you should never ever anyone here who ever gets blasé about meeting an astronaut, you're dead. You're dead. <laughs> this is the scene. This is the final scene of the sixth sense. This is the reveal, right? You are dead. If you are not excited by someone who's been into motherfucking space, right, which is the correct term for space, um, and, and you shake his hand and you go, oh, yeah, that's a hand that's strong enough to hold on to the outside of a space station. Yeah, I, I get the gist of that. And, in fact, watch out for this, because I, I did a gig with him in, in Toronto last week, and you can always tell if the person you've just met has just previously met Chris Hadfield because they have a really strong handshake, because what's happened is they've, they've, they've shook Chris Hadfield's hand, they've gone, oh, my hand was weak, I've let down the astronaut. So when they shake you, they go, I am strong! I could be on the moon! The, um... I ended up having an argument with a moon hoaxer recently. There was an article in the 14 Times, very entertaining one, uh, about the, the rumours that Stanley Kubrick had actually uh, done the moon landing, that he had faked it all. And I said, if Stanley Kubrick had faked the moon landing, we still wouldn't be on the moon. He'd still be preparing the set of the moon. He would still be reading the notes and go, I hope to have them on by about 2017, but I haven't quite found the colour yet for Neil Armstrong's fingernails. Anyways, we won't even see the fingernails, but I'll know I am Stanley Kubrick. Anyway, so... So, the point was, uh, well, actually, my biggest fear of meeting David Attenborough, apart from being a dick, which was quite a high percentage chance, saying something really... You know, you know when you prepare loads of questions in your head and you think, oh, I'll be very clever. Hello, David, very nice to meet you. I was fascinated by uh, one of your takes recently on epigenetics when you were looking at that polar bear. And, uh, as opposed to going, cold! And, uh, <laughs> so... The uh, scary cold, and um, and then I was scared as well because he was 88. I thought, what if I shake his hand too tightly because I'm overexcited because I've wanted to meet him for 40 years. And I thought, because when I met Nicholas Parsons for the first time about 11 years ago, and at that point Nicholas was I think probably in his late 90s, right? And uh, <laughs> and uh, when I shook Nicholas Parsons' hand, I overdid it and it made a weird cracking sound, <laughs> and he had to hold it between his knees for the rest of the recording. So I thought, what if I break David Attenborough? Britain will be furious. Who broke David Attenborough? That specky idiot over there. He got overly excited. Hello, David, it's brilliant to meet you. His knees are coming off. <laughs> anyway, so... So what happened? The long childhood. There we are. And the... Uh, so this is the big thing, right? Roger Sperry's frog, the long childhood, which is our brains... Most animals, when they are born, you get some sense of a level of independence, right? As we go further up the tree of life, this changes, but uh, there are... So when you see very basic animals, right, they, they come out, they swim, they fly, etc., and then we go a little bit further up the tree of life, we see that there is a certain amount of time where they may be able to be dependent on the mother and or the father. Uh, even but when a horse is born, when you see a foal born and it comes out and it kind of stands up and it's quite kind of wobbly for a little bit, but it can still have a little run and then it goes back to the mother, but it has a level of independence. Whereas when a baby is born, if anyone hears, but they, they do nothing. Right, there is just, it is, how many people here have got, it's going to be a very low number of people with children, because also, <laughs> what a great idea. When, when would be the best time to do this festival? Why, bonfire weekend. People's <laughs> diaries are entirely empty. <laughs> and um, has anyone here got, got children? I mean, but, right, that moment when you first, your child first comes out, right, and it is really astounding, isn't it? The, the, but apart from, obviously, the previous terror and also all the flashbacks to going, why did the BBC have so many dramas in the 1970s where where a doctor walks out and goes, I'm afraid both the mother and the child have died. <laughs> the, uh... <laughs> Because I had that when, my, when my, my wife was giving birth. I, I, had to, I, I didn't have to leave the room because I, uh, I had to leave the room for various medical issues. The, not my medical... I was having an asthma attack. No, her. <laughs> you know, there were things they had to do. And, uh, and, and so they said, you can't be in here. And, and so I had that five minutes just pacing up and down. And, and I, lots of different doctors, some of them in frock coats. Uh, one of them, Paul Merton, just in his <laughs> underpants, crying, get out of this imaginary dream. And um, so that is... And you, when you handed your, your son or your daughter... And you, and you kind of look down and you go, that's, that's it? That is... 
and it's probably it was five in the morning for me, and I would I kept looking, thinking, is is he meant to be doing any more? Is this? And they just leave you alone. Like my, my wife had to had to stay in this in the, in this operating theatre, and I am just holding this child, going, I don't know if this is enough. And the and then and I did every I don't know every now and again I'd go bump like that, and it would go and I go it's alive, and the well it's been another few minutes now. Boom, the um, nothing by the way, if you ever dealing with any ideas of general relativity the curvature of space-time or indeed just the general uh, I suppose broader cultural or whatever one wants to say you know relativistic nature of time there is no longer period of time than in your child's first couple of years each time you go to check on it when you go up to the bedroom I promise you the waiting for actually seeing the movement of breath is is terrifying it is one of the it, and it's uh, I mean it's a really great thing to have children it doesn't make you paranoid or weird and it doesn't make you cry a lot more at everything the um, <laughs> But uh, the I shouldn't have watched Don't Look Now recently. That was a mistake. Anyway, so the uh, fuck, I can't watch the stuff I can't watch, right? And um, but this is so. So I'm I'm holding him, and as I look at him, I start to think of the long childhood, and I start to think of my responsibility. I start to think about the fact that uh, you know because his brain is not a blank slate. There is stuff that, but there the neural pruning that is going to occur. These ideas of of, of language, of empathy, of altruism, of so many different ideas of behavior etc my and my wife and those who are closest to him what we give to him now is actually going to change the way he is as a human being and you and, and are just looking down and thinking right I have to work really I mean to be he said fuck for the first time when he was I think 20 months old and that was my fault and uh, that was it. in fact he was I think he might have been two years old and we were at my uh, my mother and father-in-law's and uh, these bricks fell down and uh, that he was he was putting up and uh, and he went fuck and uh, and my mother-in-law went oh well that's good because uh, the F phonics quite difficult at that age which is a really very optimistic woman and um, <laughs> but I was so I was looking at, at him and I was thinking about this fear yeah I'm sure you, you know that fear we think what will I do wrong what will be the mistake you know all the way the moment you have for everyone here at the very least you might not be parents but you have all been children hopefully remain so because it's a much more exciting kind of position to to be in in terms of, of levels of fascination and uh, and it, but that bit where you go what what were the mistakes made or for your foibles you know you might be able to nail them down to different things that might have happened and so I was looking at him and within four days of him being born I started to think what will be the one thing there'll be one thing that I'll do that will accidentally turn him into a mass murdering serial killer right <laughs> and and I, I kept like kind of just thinking what what's it going to be and I then flashed forward to this kind of moment like when he's, he's 31 years old and uh, and it turns out he's killed cooked and eaten like 59 people and and then he's, the police finally catch him because the drains all you know jammed and everything and and the uh, the, the signet rings bubbling at the top of the the, the grate and uh, that, that's far too much information there um, just to remind you I've just been to Toronto the films of Cronenberger in my mind and um, so anyway the uh, so I thought you know what what is the you know what will I do and and I, and I had this little I actually saw him kind of me going to the police station going Archie Archie why did you kill and cook and eat all of those people and he'll go don't you remember father <laughs> and I go no I'm surprised you don't remember father because I'm also training him to be Donald Pleasance <laughs> I uh, <laughs> I'm surprised you don't remember father. Well, what was it? It was that day on the beach. Chesil Beach, I think it was. Yes, I was eating a mivy. There was a gust of wind. The mivy fell and landed in the shingle. And you shouted at me, even though it wasn't my fault. From that point onwards, I knew I'd kill. And it's just that... Oh, tiny little things that you might do and this is what you know the, the show kind of came out of watching his mind change and watching the development of his brain of the the things like like one of my favorite things is watching him learn about comedy and learn about jokes and playing around and and foolishness and like there was uh, when he was five years old there was a point where he was in the bath and he shouted down to me and he went dad I've just put my finger up my bottom and there's all poo up there <laughs> I said, of course there is, Archie. That's where the poo is, isn't it? He went, oh, yeah, I'd forgotten, right? <laughs> I said, don't put your finger up there again, Archie. That is mainly an area of the body for things to come out from, right? Which even then, as a liberal parent, you think, is that the right thing to say? <laughs> then I... Will there be Freudian ramifications? I don't know. I don't know, right? 
And then about four minutes later, he shouted again. He went, Dad, I've just put my finger up my nose. I said, Archie, oh, that wasn't the same finger you put up your bottom. He said, of course not. I said, that is correct, Archie. One hand putting up your nose, one hand putting up your bottom, right? He then laughed and went, ha, you should do that in one of your shows. But don't say it was me, say it was Mummy. <laughs> So that was kind of the starting point of the, the brain thing, really. Um, so let me have a look. I'm going to look at the... Because uh, I also want to talk about Charles Darwin, and I was going to... Well, I didn't really have any time in the last show to talk about Richard Feynman, who is one of my, my heroes. So there's some, some little bits of... Let's see where we got to. Uh, the uh, Roger Sperry's frog. Tick. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> this is one that I forgot, because I always like to give advice to people as well, because I'm often going around to finding out things. And uh, I was, every single day, I would just want to find out new things. Uh, my, this, the, I actually told Peter Higgs this. Uh, in, in the main show, I talked a bit about meeting Peter Higgs. And you know when you're making small talk and you can't work out what small talk should be, especially when you're with Peter Higgs? And the small talk I went for was, Peter, if you're ever being attacked by an alligator, uh, alligator apparently all you need to do is play a B-flat on a French horn and that affects them emotionally and they'll stop. And he went, thank you very much. <laughs> so if you ever see Peter Higgs' five safari after crocodile attack, thank you, thank you very much. How do I get my hand out of this French horn? The uh, use the accelerator. Now, this, right, so this was another thing as well that I, I originally was going to talk about in the show, which was, uh, which I didn't get round to, was about self-consciousness, right, which is, and by which I actually really mean our daily sense of self-consciousness, our, our, our sense of self and our sense of embarrassment, because that is, again, something I've seen with my son. Which, like, for instance, when I was out in Canada and I said, oh, Archie, I might tell that story about you and putting your finger up your bottom, he went, I'd rather you didn't. And, uh, are you sure? I don't want you to. And uh, <laughs> I just want to make plants into human beings. The, um, it's a very specific reference to the film Mutations, which hopefully you've seen. We're starring Tom Baker and uh, Donald Pleasance wants to save the world by allowing human beings to photosynthesise. Oh! Um, <laughs> now in Jonglers, that bit storms it. <laughs> Come on, everyone. I see the stag nights are in. Who likes the later films directed by Jack Cardiff, the cinematographer for Powell and Pressburger? We all do, you motherfucker! Let's go with it! <laughs> Don't forget to mention Black Narcissus. What do you think I am, a wanker? I love nuns going through jeopardy. <laughs> so, um... <laughs> Another reason for retirement there. <laughs> and so the, I, cause I, right, I am, quite, I am very self-conscious. I am very, I'm oh, like, where, that's why I'm bad at sport, right? One of the things about sport is uh, that you, that, you know, people go, I was just in the moment. I didn't even, know, I'm never. That doesn't happen to me. So when I was at school, like that throwing of a ball, I could feel every bit of my, my arm is just there, and my head is going. You're not going to throw any distance at all. Feel everything in your arm, all your muscles. Are, Plop, right? That's why. It's uh, why I would then go plop at the end. It seemed to make it worse, and the boys bullied me more. But it's like, I, I'm very self... I don't get kind of... This was a thing a while ago when I was at Glastonbury, and uh, this, which I, I love. I still go to a lot of music festivals, and uh, I remember go, I, I didn't go and see the, the Rolling Stones when they played. Not that old man's band, no. I went to see Public Enemy instead. <laughs> they were only in their 50s. And uh, <laughs> they were great, actually. It's, uh, and, and Chuck D and me, obviously, you know. And... And, uh, hey, where'd you get the Cardi from? You know, Chuck, they're all M&S. Mm, brilliant. And uh, have I told you my joke about 911? Yeah. Anyway, so uh, the <laughs> so I went to see uh, Public Enemy, and uh, there was a bit where actually one of the worst things I saw was the year after, um, where there was a, a guy. This is something you know, these kind of strange bullies that are also now very plumed and plucked and tanned. You know that kind of thing where people who are still aggressive and unpleasant in a masculine way. You know, these overly masculine men, but they also pluck their eyebrows and they're kind of, you know, tanned. That really, it's a strange, horrible mix uh, of stuff. And there was this bloke who looked like that. And Because every now and again, I'm at a festival and I look at people and I go, why are you here? You're not a festival person. There's th the rest of culture's for you. Fuck off. You know, this, <laughs> everything else in culture, everything that is boorish and vile and simplistic and mundane, that's for you. Just let me be in a field with some other people who read a Robert Anton Wilson book. <laughs> Fuck off, right? Very particular, by the way. And I'm not... I, if you haven't read a Robert Anton Wilson book, I'm not having a go at you, right? So, <laughs> sorry. A lot of pretty alienating for the people there who haven't read Quantum 
psychology. I think we have. <laughs> anyway, so... <laughs> But I do, this is, it's like when, when you're at some festivals, like the small festivals, and you see, and you go, why are the dicks here? Well, there's dicks here! This is how I can get away from Bell and Sebastian! Move further back! <laughs> you're not allowed to like any bands on the Chemical Underground label from the late 90s. Get away! You're ruining everything. No, we are going to ruin it for you, because we want all your culture. Anything you like that is in any way moving, empathetic or altruistic, we're going to turn into a car advert. Those kind of people, right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I was when I was watching uh, Public Enemy, it was mainly Chuck D and some friends, right? It wasn't many of the original, but they were, they were fantastic. And at one point, Chuck D just he went, "Come on, put your hands in the air like you just don't care." And I tried, but <laughs> I always care. There's no bit where my arms got to about here and then went, "It's you," oh, yeah. right? <laughs> and and then he went, "Everyone make the peace sign." And I I feel I'm, uh, even on marches when I was a kid, when I was a student, I I could never do it. Students united. We'll never be. I can't do chants. I'll do the march. I'll hold the placard. I don't do chants, right? And which is good because when I, the first march I went on, I was 18, right? Students united will never be defeated. And then we got charged by some horses. And I thought, well, it's all right. We're all going to stand here, though, aren't we? And then I looked around. Everyone had fucked off, right? So they don't. They don't even mean what they sing. They're like the Archbishop of York, anyway, right? So the. So there was this, uh, and so that, that bit, and, and then, so, so it said make the peace sign, and I thought, what if I don't? What if everyone's there doing that, and I'm standing up just out of social embarrassment, and they go, who's the idiot who loves war? <laughs> Smash his face in, right? Because <laughs> that's the thing, even when I'm lost in the moment, there's a little bit of me going, look at you. <laughs> Lost in the moment. <laughs> Idiot, right? That's the thing, that's the problem I had. And that was actually the same, that, that festival, it was two years ago, where I saw one of my favourite gigs. The, the, the artist that I love, well, one of my favourite artists is obviously Marky e. Smith from The Fall, because when he played Glastonbury this year, very few people go on stage actually with an enormous urine stain. Um, I don't know if you saw The Fall, uh, this one, he was, his opening line was, thanks for turning the monitors down, fuckers. There we go. So that's, uh, <laughs> and he was brilliant, he was amazing, uh, giant sand. And then and and Nick Cave, Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds, and I went to see them two years ago, and it was just the the excitement. There's a friend of mine who I take to festivals. He doesn't like music, but he has a car, and <laughs> I that's true. I, I I can't drive, and I go. It'll be really nice. There's a field, and they do snacks, and uh, <laughs> almost don't mention the music at all. And uh, the oh, it's just a pyramid. It's oh, they've put a band in it, but normally it's just a place of worship. Anyway, so the. Um, <laughs> So anyway, I was, uh, I, I said, oh, you, I've got to take to see Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds because they are just one of the greatest bands in the world. And, and he went, oh, I don't really know anything about them. I said, really? I said, you're my age, you're, or 45. You don't know anything about Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds? He went, no. What are they like? I said, well, how do I do? I said, well, the best way of describing Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds is imagine a ship that's been sailing for eternity, but it's also been sinking for eternity. And on that ship are a house band that never stop playing. They literally play throughout the whole day. As the ship sinks for eternity, they just keep playing and playing and playing, and their beards get longer and longer and longer, and they become entwined in the instruments, and yet the music that comes out from, from the beard-entwined instruments becomes more and more beautiful. And this band is led by a chimpanzee that's recently become sentient and declared himself a priest. <laughs> and after the gig, he went, yeah, you're right, really. <laughs> the, um... But this, it is, this self, this is, to me, the battle. There, there is this constant battle about self-consciousness where, uh, it's like with, with things, uh, again, going back to being a man, right? Uh, I, I'm not bothered by, like, there's a, there's a friend of mine who, he's, uh, I don't know if he's a friend or an enemy. You know when you're not sure if it's just someone who's near you and proximity has made you confuse that with actually some sense of friendship, whereas really it's just an enemy who knows your address and likes bothering you, right? And, and he wants, I, I, was, I was just unpacking my rucksack, which is all just filled with stuff, right? And, I was and, and my uh, deodorant fell out, right? And I, I think at that time I was using Dove or something like that. And because uh, I don't care about my body shape. You know? And uh, it's me and Paul Merton standing in our pants for the advert. Stop going on about that. Anyway, so the. Um, <laughs> But I was, uh, so I, I, and it's like, I think officially it's a woman's deodorant, but I don't care. I don't, I, it doesn't matter to me. It's just some deodorant, right? And, and he went, what's that? And I went, what's my deodorant? He went, what? But that's a woman's deodorant. I said, but that doesn't matter, does it? He went, that's weird. 
I said, it doesn't. It's just got a smell that's that's not sweat. I mean, it's not a. I said, and, and I genuinely, the other day, I I was I was in in the boots just across the road in Houston. I went, where's your deodorant? And he sent me there. And I looked and went, this isn't deodorant. This is shaving cream. And because I've never looked at the men's section, because the men's section seems to be filled with things that are meant to make you smell as a man, right? And that would be disconcerting for me. If I, if I suddenly put on a men's, I'd go, this body is not mine. I'd get some kind of dysmorphia if I smell of kind of manly herbs or whatever they use in these things, right? And I said to him, it doesn't matter. He went, no, but it might be... He actually said it might be confusing. And I went, what? Like, someone's... I'm going to be doing a gig and I've put on a lot of deodorant, and someone goes, this is a bit weird. There's my mind's not computing this, because it looks like Robin, who I know is male, but he smells like woman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's just... And it's like, I've never had a moment in my life where I've kind of been going, hang on a minute, I can't remember if I'm a man or a woman. Man, thank heavens for that. <laughs> thank heavens for that Proustian shortcut. And the... Uh... So this, this whole... And this is... We ended up having... This is a guy that I have a lot of arguments with about, because I don't really care. I try, even though, of course, by, by dint of being a man, it means I'm a bit of an asshole, you know, but I, I try to be... I don't even try to be unmanly. It's just over years and years, all of the general sense of man is just less and less... And uh, it's the fact that I even I do actually have slight breasts as well, which is which I've always had. That I've had them, which was skins at PE. If you ever had to see that, it's one of the most embarrassing things when you're eight years old and all the guys are going. <laughs> anyway, so the, that's true. I have got them. So I, if anyone does say, show us your tits, I go. I certainly will. Move back, Sarah Pascoe. I don't think they want to see yours. I think that's Stagnard saying, "What about the hairy man?" <laughs> and I will. Hmm, they look sad and nauseated now like they might never be able to have sex again. Ah, uh, my benign eugenics through showing my hairy breasts. <laughs> anyway, the... <laughs> Three. And uh, I've never said, by the way, I've never said... I wasn't going to talk about this. Uh, it's just... Uh, I've basically, because I haven't done this for ages, there's just lots of thoughts going, can we come out? And uh, so I've never before said benign eugenics from my hairy breast. And... Uh, <laughs> but the... Uh, there we are, that's uh, benign eugenics from my hairy breast. And uh, so I was... Uh, but and what was I talking about? Oh, yeah, so, so this guy is, is... I think he does worry about not being manly enough. There is... There is I don't know if... They, like, one of the things... I once had an argument with him uh, about uh, breastfeeding in public. You may remember there was a story... It was Holly McNeish wrote uh, a poem a while ago which was inspired by... There was a woman, I can't remember where it was, that's happened a couple of times, who was uh, recently breastfeeding in, uh, in a cafe and she, she was told not to, to breastfeed in a cafe. And, uh, and, I, and this guy said to me, he said, yeah, well, I, I think that's... That, that's right, though, you know, because, uh, you know, it's, it, it's not a, a nice thing to see, is it, when you're eating food? I said, well, don't look. Why are you looking? You know, it's just, he said, no, but I'm just saying, it's, you know, it's a bit, it's, it's not, it's not a nice, I said, but you can't, what, I don't understand the worry about this, because it's just a woman breastfeeding, and just look at some other thing. You shouldn't be staring at a woman you don't know anyway, that's going to be disconcerting. Just, he goes, no, 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 but I think it's, you know, I mean, it's not exactly natural, is it? And which was, a and, and then he kind of, I said, what, what, you? he went, no, 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 but you know what I mean? I said, I really don't know what you mean. He said, well, look, the reason I didn't let my wife breastfeed in public, and I said, what? He said, well, well, no, it was a joint decision. I said, OK, what was it? And she went, well, our decision, she said, said was, you know, that we were worried uh, that, that other men uh, might, you know, kind of be drawn to it and, and might, might be, uh, you, know, you know, turned on by it and they'd, they'd kind of stare and stuff. And I said, again, I think you're revealing more of your inner word because <laughs> that, that idea of... If any man here who's... Ever, right, generally, women breastfeeding, men's reaction is not to go... Huh. Right, it is quite. If you've ever been in a room with, like, for for men here, the the first time that a female friend of yours had uh, a, a a baby, and you popped around to see them, and there might have been a moment where she went, "Oh, do you know what? I think I think Sophie's a bit hungry. Um, do you want if I breastfeed?" Right, men very rarely wrap by going, "Mind, not one iota. <laughs> Go right ahead. Take as long as you want." She looks like a very hungry baby, right? <laughs> More often than not, they react by going, What an amazing ceiling! What an amazing ceiling! I've never noticed that your ceiling is partially engraved! Look at the lamp fitting! What a mesmeric lamp fitting! I can't imagine looking down for this lamp fitting for 15 to 20 minutes or more! <laughs> I can still hear slurping. I, look at the corners! Look at the corners! 
It's really... Ah! I saw! I saw! I didn't mean to see! Ah! Let me take out these eyes with my frog spoon! <laughs> right? It's just... <laughs> it's just meant that's not the real... Oh, that's it. Keep on going. And very... I've never met a man who, who, who said, I'll tell you my favourite thing. I'll tell you my favourite thing. You know when a woman's got one of her breasts out, but it's obscured by a baby's skull? <laughs> 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 2.15 on a Saturday. So, uh... <laughs> but this was... So this thing that happened was basically, uh, I, um... So this, this... I had an experience where I very rarely, uh... Well, I very rarely socialise because of actually the kind of job that I do where I actually, I generally like just being on my own, watching documentaries about Bikini Kill. And, uh, which if you haven't seen The Punk Girl, by the way, is a fucking brilliant documentary. And, uh, that's the one thing that I have managed as, as, as a performer. I might not have always entertained people, but I've always given them either a reading or DVD list. <laughs> So, um, and it's, it's a really great documentary and I would, I would highly recommend it, right? Anyway, so, uh, but when I do socialise, I, li I like to socialise in kind of mixed groups generally, uh, just, you know, just, it's, I think... The, so I went out with, uh, this, this guy rang me up, he said, do you want to go out for a drink? I said, yeah, that's, that's fine, I was actually free, I didn't think six music would be finished at about, about 6.30, I'll, I'll come along for a drink. And he didn't tell me that he was actually going to bring some other people as well. And they were men, right? And they, and almost the moment I walked in, I thought, oh, it's too many men that I don't know. And then they're, because they're men who don't know me, they'll have to be men all the time. They'll have to overdoing, because that sometimes happens when men meet men, they go, I don't know what kind of man this is, so, you know, and this was, and it was like that, right? So we sat down, and uh, the first guy he goes up to the bar, and he comes back with some drinks, and he goes, uh, "You seen her behind the the bar? You seen her? Uh, yeah, she's got him, hasn't she?" I said, "What?" He said, well, "Well, she got him. You must have seen." I said, "No, what 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 she got?" He said, "Well, she's got a, you know, she's got got a pair, isn't she?" I said, I, what a pair of... It, you know, I thought I'd just let's get all the information out. Let's not, you know, because it might I might be otherwise I'd be on tenter hooks. Which particular pair of things is it? And uh, and eventually, well, you must have seen she's got you know breasts. You see a couple of uh, and I said, yeah, a lot of them have nowadays. It's, uh, <laughs> it's a fad. <laughs> and uh, and then he kind of looks at me as if to go, mm, not a proper man really at all. And then this just kind of went on and on where everyone had to just keep going. Oh yeah, there. And and I was. What was great was my friend who was there. He's never like that with me because he knows that I'm not kind of. And but he's obviously like that with them. So we had to spend the whole time being two people, like really obviously, like where he's kind of have to go. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know why they're doing it. Was it Andrea Dworkin who said? Oh, yeah. And the. Uh, <laughs> And then this kind of built and built and built until uh, then this other guy turned up. And I'd met him and I thought, oh, well, this would be interesting. But for some reason, we straight away hit upon talking about British films with uh, cannibalism in them. There was something he mentioned that sparked me to mention The Cook, The Thief, The Wife and Her Lover. And the next thing you know, we're talking about the films of Peter Greenaway and the music of Michael and Nyman. And then we moved back to a film, in fact, that I showed last night at the Phoenix, a brilliant film called Deathline. And we're suddenly we're talking about cannibal movies and, and, and English and British art movies. And then two of the other guys kind of go, oh, we hadn't known we could talk about this. It's fine then. And kind of all the masculinity, the, 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 the enforced, the kind of, you know, nuts, zoo, shiny mag masculinity starts to disappear. And except for one guy. One guy is, he, you know that thing, one of the things I genuinely feel sad about is I think some people are so scared of ever saying what's really in their head that they may never say what they mean almost throughout their whole life. Uh, this is one of the... It's a bit like, you know, drunkenness sometimes. The, the, you know, our, our fear of... That's what I was thinking, actually, with, with, with drink, is I was recently thinking, why is it that uh, in most cultures uh, that are teetotal, they uh, may well also be cultures that have arranged marriages? And then I went, of course because they'll never be drunk enough to go, do you want to go out? And so someone has to arrange them for them. That's the genuinely, like, kind of, oh, bloody hell, I can't bring it. You know, the, the number of people who've met each other sober and then had a... It's, it's low. It's low, right? Anyway, so the... Uh, I haven't met my wife sober up for over 15 years. What a surprise she'll have when she's 83. It was me all the time. Not the specky one in the cardigan. Yes. <laughs> and look at our little Donald Pleasance, what we made. The... Uh, <laughs> Uh, anyway, so, but 
I've gone off the point. Was the one? We don't know. Um, so this was... So, so anyway, this, this guy is sitting there and he now doesn't know what to do because he's never heard them. They normally just kind of go, way like this all the time. And then he's sitting there and I genuinely felt sad because I thought, he's not getting involved and I was trying to get him involved and he was like... Uh, 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 and, and then right near the end of the evening when everyone's quite engrossed in talking about different kind of independent British movies, suddenly um, a glass smashed just by the bar and then just he on his own, went, hey. <laughs> And it was the most melancholy <laughs> celebration of glass breakage I have ever seen. And it was like, but we all used to... Those are the old days. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> and that's and then I sometimes think is that only a masculine thing or is it also you know, with it, any any group that but, but when you're in a secure group because about the same week that that incident happened at the uh, it was the Blue Post in fact uh, the, about the same week that happened uh, there I was doing a gig in Wolverhampton and I finished quite late because uh, I'd overrun and uh, I was walking back to the the budget hotel that I was using that evening. And I got to the traffic lights. And as I got to the traffic lights, uh, a stretch limo pulled up. And as it pulled up, uh, the rear, uh, well, the kind of side windows, the, the, uh, the, the, the back seat windows, whatever they are on a stretch limo, they lowered down. And three women with pink Stetsons looked out and went, <laughs> right? Oh, ironically, obviously, I'm not totally deluded. I'm, I'm not thinking. <laughs> Looks like I'm the sexiest guy in Wolverhampton. <laughs> Again. <laughs> so, so, anyway, so obviously, like, look at the old man, you know, and uh, ha ha ha. And then they disappeared <laughs> briefly, and their pink Stetsons and heads were then replaced by three sets of mooning buttocks, right? Uh, which then remained there until the lights changed and they moved off, right? And I just thought, oh, well, Friday night in Wolverhampton, that kind of thing happens, I suppose. And then I started to get worried, because I thought, what if... Because it looks like everyone's having a great time, but what if actually, inside that car, that's th those three women, that's not what's going through the head at all. That, in fact, they are, they're there with their asses out, right? Hey, aren't we having a brilliant time making fun of the old man, right? But actually, inside, one of them's going, why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? I don't want to... I've never wanted to... Well, I'm 39 years old and I'm mooning an elderly and probably ill man <laughs> trying to cross the road with an element of confusion. I mean, why am I... I'd look at them having a brilliant time. Oh, yeah, yeah, Kelly and Jean, they love this, but I, I don't want to do that. Why don't, why don't I ever share the things that I really care about, which is astronomy. I love... Astronomy, when I saw the ISS go past on Christmas Eve, the joy, but I couldn't share that joy with them because they'd laugh at me because I loved something. Astronomy, so I just, uh, hey, and we're just here drinking snaps and mooning. Oh, God, I hate my life and I hate Kelly and Jean. Look at Kelly and Jean, the idiots, right? But she doesn't realise that Jean at the far end's going, oh, oh, God. Will this ever end? <laughs> Look at Michelle and, oh, she's so... Oh, let's all moon! Let's all moon! And now, I know I'm not enjoying this, it's cold. I just... I have a secret fascination with continental philosophy. I know I shouldn't, because Derrida doesn't necessarily match up to a lot of rationalism and science. The nature of postmodernism and interpretation does But nevertheless, I like it. But if they ever know my secret love of Derrida, then we would never... Oh, God, life is bleak! <laughs> and then in the middle, there's Kelly, or Jean, I can't remember which now, right? <laughs> and, and the other two have now sat down and she's still there and she's going, not only do I hate doing this, but also the back of my knee has slightly put the window up and jammed my buttocks. <laughs> <laughs> and they're all clapping, going, well done, well done, Kelly or Jean, well done, Kelly or Jean. <laughs> We're going down the motorway now. <laughs> I feel metaphorically and physically cold. <laughs> they might have been having fun, though. <laughs> so, so, anyway, so those were the things that I was going to talk about that didn't get tidy. But now, let's have a look at what we haven't dealt with, which we are still on page one, by the way. The, uh, oh, that was the one that I was going to start talking about, and then I forgot. The, uh, I'm not even going to talk about the man who wrote to me about free will being an illusion, but it's quite a, a, a wry take. Anyway, so the... Um, <laughs> This was the one where, again, this is what I meant to talk about. The, uh, that's what I've forgotten was my catchphrase. 
Oh, oh it's Because I haven't done a long stand-up gig for eight, I've forgotten my catch. I was like, oh, I'm sorry, I meant to tell you something entirely different. I apologise, Peterborough, good night. And uh, <laughs> this was... But the bit of self-awareness, which is when you actually share it on stage, um, because when I was... This was a while back where I was in... Uh, I was at Marlebone Station, and that bit... You know when sometimes we look at certain people and we think, oh, they look a little bit mad or they're, they're eccentric, eccentric individuals? And there was this guy at the bottom of the escalators, and he was just basically... He was marching up and down uh, by the escalators, just going, what's my favourite Thomas Hardy novel? What's my favourite Thomas Hardy novel? I'm not sure. What is my favourite Thomas Hardy novel? It's not Tess the D'Urbervilles. Very bleak. Far from the Madden crowd. No! <laughs> Jude the Obscure! Right. And, <laughs> and then he got on, on the escalators, and, uh, which I liked. I liked this idea that there was this guy, as I walked, you know, approaching him, and I think he'd just been to the, those books on it, that he might well have just been, you know, it's his lucky thing before getting on the escalator. His fear of escalators, well, I mustn't die in case there's an escalator accident without being certain of what my favourite Thomas Hardy novel is. <laughs> and I could see people walking past him going, stupid old mad, what an idiot, right? And I didn't, I genuinely didn't think that. I thought, that's, he's just talking to himself, right? And, and then I got on the train to Banbury, and there were five men, probably slightly drunk, they'd had a few drinks, it was only, it was like Thursday afternoon. And they were just talking shit. Just absolute shit, just back and forth, right? Just really showing off and screaming at each other. And I started to think, you know, really, what is the better thing? To talk to yourself intelligently or talk in a group like fucking idiots. <laughs> so I've picked the first one, and sometimes I place people in front of me. To... <laughs> but that was an example, by the way. You know, I said at the beginning, there's some stories that I remember doing ages ago and I only did a few times, and I can't remember how they went. That was one of them. <laughs> so, blooper reel part one. The, uh, that's going to be a great shot because it's just over your shoulder, that one, so it's kind of quite alluring. The, um... <laughs> But this is that, that bit of, of, you know, again, of the, of the kind of self-consciousness of... Oh, I, I'm not even talking about that actually. I'm just going to... Oh, yeah, Lona Frank, right? I'll talk about the right. We, we genuinely haven't got onto the other pages yet. How long have I got, by the way? Uh, about halfway through. Oh, OK, right. That, I, I reckon we can do the other uh, 51. The... Uh, <laughs> this is... Uh, oh, do you know what? I'm not even going to mention this, this. I used to have ten minutes on this, which was just anyone who goes, have you sexism? What about sexism towards men? Fuck off. That's all. That's, that was basically... <laughs> What the ten minutes said. That was all. Anyone? Oh, aren't we? The, yeah, yeah, yeah. You really are the most depressed. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's fine. And that's the thing you have to remember with Twitter, Jerry. All social media is don't get involved. It's the best thing. Just mute them. Just, just fucking. Let, it's just it, the, that bit where when you're a kid and you think, wow, wouldn't it be amazing to have telepathy? And now we do. And you go, I didn't know all these things were going on inside people's heads. <laughs> oh, what a disappointment. <laughs> but the, Jenny, every what about sex? But that's what a lot of people are. Yeah, well, actually, I. I'm a victim of sexism because I was walking on the street the other day and some women made a noise as I went past. Oh, that wasn't because you were a man, it's because you're a dick. They're separate issues. <laughs> like, this is, they didn't go, oh, look, a man. They went, that kind of man. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I can't be that kind of... <laughs> yeah, anyway, so, um, we've all seen a ghost. I'm not going to deal with that one either. <laughs> the, uh... <laughs> This was, this was, I, I did a Skeptics in the pub gig where uh, I wanted to talk about this because I think everyone has seen a ghost, but uh, you just don't necessarily, uh, well, what happens is culturally it depends on, on, on different kind of the way you've been brought up and what you actually believe the world contains. So if, like, like for instance, I've seen a ghost, right? I'll tell you about the time. Uh, I've seen a ghost uh, on at least three occasions. Uh, most of them were when I was in my early 20s and I lived near a cemetery. And uh, sometimes the cemetery was a shortcut if I was drunk and I would climb over the wall and exactly halfway, it's always exactly halfway, you suddenly see what appears to be a weeping nun from Black Narcissus. No, I'm going to get to that later, mate. <laughs> Hurry up. Shongless Lester is angry. <laughs> anyway, so... But you, you go, oh, it's a nun, there's a nun ghost, right? And you think, right, well, just quick, I'm, I'm rationalist, it probably isn't a ghost. It looks like a ghost in the corner of my eye, right? And then you climb over the wall the other side and then you look back and you realise it's just one of those really annoying... Sh why they make graves in the shape of weeping uh, nuns, I don't know, but they do. They're that kind of shape, which means you can think like that. Now, of course, that's because, for the way that I currently think about the world, I don't believe in ghosts. So, therefore, once I've seen what I believe is a ghost, by the time I've run away and got over the wall, I can rationalise. I never rationalise until I'm over the wall. 
just in case. <laughs> uh, but that's the kind... Whereas if you're from, uh, you know, a, a, a culture or your upbringing is such that ghosts do exist, it doesn't matter what I say when I go, it was probably a nun-shaped grave, they'll go, no, this one really was a ghost. And as we remember it over and over again, the picture becomes more authentically like a ghost. Now, I once did a radio show with Sarah Miles from uh, Ryan's Daughter and uh, The Sailor Who Fell From Grace to the Sea and The Servant, etc. And I can't do the full Halley World listing, but there's three to start you off. White Mischief as well, that was hers. And, um, and she's into some quite quirky things. And uh, she suddenly went to me, you know Richard Dawkins, don't you? I went, well, I know him a bit. Yeah, I've done, done, done some, some events with him. She went, I want to get in contact with Richard Dawkins because there's this house and I want to put him in it. I want to chain him to a bed <laughs> and leave him overnight. Then he'll believe in ghosts. I said, here's his email. <laughs> so, um... <laughs> I do... <laughs> different thing, you know, this... So, this is... I've said, I keep having to... Right, right, so that's... Uh, I'm not even... Right, the rest of that sheet can just leave. There we go. Uh, I don't know. Oh, right, this is now a very different kind of... This was one of my favourite facts that never made the show, which I loved, was when I read that the dodecahedron was a forbidden shape. You probably all know this. Do you know about the dodecahedron? I mean, it's f that, how cool is that, that there used to be forbidden shapes? And the reason it was a forbidden... I think it was Pythagoras who forbid the shape, and he did a lot of shape forbidding. I mean, looking back... He, he was like a no-platforming student of nowadays. Always no-platforming, different shapes that he considered to be too mystical. And, uh, and he did. He, he kind of... Uh, he looked at the dodecahedron and uh, he, he thought, this is... If we concentrate too much on that, it, 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 we must... And I thought that... The idea that there are forbidden shapes... A number of people, like myself, right? Mathematics, geometry, were never really that exciting for me. But if... On the, if on the first day, right, of you doing, like, proper maths, beyond times, tables, stuff, like, proper maths and proper geometry, if your maths teacher had gone, right, we're going to start off with some geometry now, but before we continue, I just have to tell you this thing, which is, you must never go into that cupboard there! The reason I keep it so heavily padlocked is... That is where I keep the forbidden shapes. <laughs> Wouldn't you go, fucking hell? <laughs> That's a, a world of forbidden... If uh, some of you are very good and go as far as A-level, I might give you the key. I just... Uh, that's like the delight that I saw. I've just been doing this documentary about general relativity. And it's so exciting when I was... Uh, Faye Dowker, who's a, a, a wonderful uh, physics lecturer at Imperial, and I went to her fourth year, first fourth year lecture, which is about general relativity, and it doesn't have the maths, so I could kind of understand it to a certain amount there in the curvature of space-time and how Einstein kind of came to those ideas and ideas of acceleration. And the genuinely... There are a few more joyous or delightful things to see than a group of, I suppose, they were 20-something, you know, women and men who, as they left, I, I interviewed some of them afterwards, and they've spent three years learning the language that now means that at the beginning of the fourth year, they can start to understand general relativity. And that, to me, is, you know, I never have that. I will never have a deep understanding of nearly all physics because I will never have the maths. But these kids, they waited three years learning and learning and going, and they genuinely were leaving going, can't believe it. I've got the first glimmer, the first glimmer, the first real, and that is delightful. There's no, there are no jokes. It is just to, when you see the excitement of ideas, that's what, you know, the, a lot of the, the kind of the, the full length, the, the actual show is, is that's what it, it's every single day trying to read something and then looking at the world and going, it's not quite, it, like when I first started reading about general relativity, and I think I overdid it on the first day. Because <laughs> reading about the curvature of space-time, I genuinely found myself tilting slightly as I walked. <laughs> as if... As if I, like I was going, oh, it is curving a bit, it's a bit too much! Oh! It's, I, and it, it took about a day to go, no, you don't need to actually bend with the psychosomatic curvature of space-time. And uh, so, right, the, uh, the, the bits that I, I, I... Well, the bits I really... There's lots... Of, oh, I never remember... Sorry, sorry, this is just a little bit... Oh, get, right, so... There were two bits that I wanted to read from, again, which we never filmed, and it was... Uh, I did a show about Charles Darwin, and, uh, Char again, Charles Darwin is one of the reasons that I love... Well, people I 
love Charles Darwin uh, and uh, Jocelyn Bell Burnell and Marie Curie and people like that. It's just that Jocelyn Bell Burnell bio is fantastic. If you don't know Jocelyn Bell Burnell, she was uh, the woman who basically pretty much discovered the idea of, of, of pulsars, which very briefly initially people might have almost thought was some kind of communication due to just this, this the perfection uh, of, of the apparent perfection of the timing of it. And uh, it's really amazing to see that hopefully I think there is moving on in terms of you know women in science where there used to be this idea of some kind of you know well I don't think women would be very interested in that unless it makes something delicious <laughs> and uh, and I was talking to Jocelyn because Jocelyn a lot of people feel you know should have won the Nobel Prize for her work and, and she says she doesn't mind she says if you win the Nobel Prize they never give you any others whereas uh, I didn't win it so I just get prizes all the time then have a slap up feast <laughs> and all these different kind of and, and I said to her so when you had done this and said and they were all concentrating on, on the men involved in the research and I said, did the newspapers approach you at all? She went, only the sun asked me a question. <laughs> and their question was, are you taller than Princess Margaret? And, <laughs> and I hope we've moved on from that. But this thing of, of fascination, one of the things that really got me into, into Charles Darwin was, and actually reading his books, was because of things like, well, there's a beautiful... If, you've, if you ever read uh, Voyage of the Beagle, or indeed the, 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 you, know, you can actually read uh, you know, longer versions of his journals, and, and they are beautiful. They're beautiful because you get this fascination. You get this idea of nature shock. I think this is one thing that we have to work very hard at as human beings, which is to avoid our cynicism. And because we are fed so much information we can become overly blasé to all of the things that are around us the things which genuinely are fantastic you know if you saw many of the things that you use every single day if they were in an annual that you read in the late 1970s if they were in your 2000 ad your look and learn or whatever you would go bloody hell is that actually going to be available in 2015 right there are incredible things but because they're just churned out so fast you just think well i need it and i have to have it and this is you know you get and this is what i think think the line is at one point I think he was in the Brazilian rainforest quite early uh, on the actual voyage of the Beagle and Charles Darwin talked about the fact that he tried to concentrate on what he'd seen he we now have images from around the world and beyond images into the universe transmitted to us and we can see them we can see remarkable things we can watch Sky at Night, we can watch those nature documentaries I was talking about earlier. Uh, there's so many different ways of accessing a view of, of the world and beyond that, of course, Darwin didn't have that. Darwin had sometimes other people's notebooks, sometimes travellers' books, etc. But suddenly he was confronted by nature. Uh, a nature that until then he'd been, you know, he collected bugs and he'd done that, and of course the hedgerows and all the beautiful things that there are, you know, where, where he was brought up as well, there, there's beauty. But this was now, he had never seen such a variety of colours, and that's part of it. The, the, the colours of the bugs there, of course, bugs here, the, we don't have the same variety just because we have a kind of different background as well, different camouflage required. And he was, he talks about the fact that he says, one's eyes attempt to follow the flight of a gaudy butterfly, but are soon distracted by some strange tree or fruit today my mind is a chaos of delight and I think that is the thing which you have to try and capture which is the chaos of delight which is to be a living thing that is able to ask questions with all of the downside that has uh, which is you know the, again as I'm talking about the paranoias that we may well have the uh, the self-consciousness and self-awareness that stops us being what we might want to be but also on the other side of it the ability to then you know to get your own telescope and you know if anyone here has never looked through a telescope at the rings of Saturn do it tonight if you can, right? Uh, and just, you know, after the fireworks, so you may well go, oh, that, oh no, that's not, oh, no. That, but it's like, but it, it, like I said about standing in the Lovell telescope there, of course, something that is human made, actually seeing the ring, and it just looks monochrome, it's smaller monochrome, but however many times you have seen, however clear the images are, they cannot replace the excitement of genuinely experiencing looking at Saturn, right, through a telescope. And this is why, you know, Charles Darwin, Richard Feynman, the Darwin thing, that this was my illustration which I wanted to use which is this book I love I, I've read I think about eight of, of, of Darwin's books uh, I haven't really read all of them there's uh, he wrote about many many things and uh, Steve Jones uh, who I don't know if he's still based at, at UCL where we are now but Steve Jones wonderful writer of Almost Like a Whale uh, and, and many other books as well Language of Genes um, he if I asked him about Darwin because he, he, he loves Charles Darwin and I, I said are there any books about Charles Darwin I shouldn't read he said don't read his books about barnacles he became overly obsessed <laughs> and, uh, and they are still the major books on barnacles they are 
bar. No one else could be bothered. So <laughs> 150 years later, Darwin's done it. It's fine. Just leave the barnacles alone, right? And this was his final book. This was Darwin's book that he wrote when he was in his 70s. And uh, and I love this, which is because again, it's about observation. To me, like what what a lot of comedians are is we are very lazy scientists that will take the shortest route. A scientist may see something and go, "What does that mean? What does that entail?" I need to get some kind of grant now to research this for the next 10 years of my life. Whereas a comedian sees something and goes, ah, that's very interesting. Oh, I've turned it into a pun already. So that, and, then, and thus I feel sated. So this was, uh, that's why Charles Darwin as a stand-up comedian was, I, I, I used to have play around with this little thing, kind of, no, John, please welcome, he's always noting stuff. He's live at the O2, Charles Darwin! Whee! Oh, what is it about finches, eh? Some of them have quite small beaks. Some of them have quite long, stubby beaks. I don't know, different islands, different foodstuffs, eh? <laughs> so, um, <laughs> someone here hasn't done the reading. Anyway, so, uh, <laughs> seen this one at the front. Look at the way his nose has developed. I imagine it means that, shut up, shut up! <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> this is, uh, <laughs> Well, why have you chosen that jumper? Because that will make it less likely for you to then have a second... Oh, shut up, Darwin, about jumper choices. I'm just saying you won't meet a lady and have the babies. Um, <laughs> but this was the final book, right? This was uh, the formation of vegetable mould through the action of worms with observation on their habits, right? I love this book. I love this book because it, it, it is a page-turner, right? It properly is. I, I know when, when anyone... When I... When the, my wife... really. Why have you got that? When Because... It's well, firstly, why have I got it? Because I want to know about the formation of vegetable mold through the action of worms with observation on the habits, obviously. And it is just this joy of knowing here was a human being who had in his youth traveled the world and then spent the majority of the rest of his adult life sitting at home, looking at different things, looking at the, the skeletons of pigeons, looking and trying to put together this wonderful idea which has illuminated why life on Earth is as it is. And it is a theory which, of course, we've been building on and we continue. Well, I haven't really got involved but other people have been building it right and this is so he covered the exotic and the bizarre and so many delightful things but his final book is about earthworms earthworms that are around us all the time any of you here who even have a tiny little garden you can go home now you can dig up you can find some earthworms right they can appear to be mundane this is the important thing even those things that appear to be mundane as Charles Darwin worked out they are vital they are constantly churning up the soil they are aerating the soil they're helping also to protect for instance artifacts as well old piece of China there's so many different things that the actions of worms are vital for. And this is why I love this book, because it is filled with his worm-based experiments. And again, as an old man, this is an old man digging in his garden in Kent and doing more than that as well. This is my favourite paragraph. Worms do not possess any sense of hearing. They took not the least notice of the shrill notes from a metal whistle, which was repeatedly sounded near them. Think of that, right? Think of that. It's an old man with a whistle blowing at worms, right? Just <laughs> beep, beep, beep. Nothing. <laughs> Note that down, Leonard. <laughs> lesser scientists would stop there with the whistle. Darwin was not a lesser scientist. Let's move on to part two. Nor did they take any notice of the deepest and loudest tones of a bassoon. <laughs> <laughs> got the bassoon out. <laughs> it's just, it's just, they were indifferent to shouts. So it's all of these <laughs> beer, 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 whole day of whist. Beer, 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 beer. Tuesday, bassoon. Blup, 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 blup. Wednesday, I worm, I worm, I worm. Still nothing, right? This, by the way, is how jazz was invented. And then, <laughs> and then he goes, when we took them in and began to play the piano to them, we noticed that the note C in the bass clef was... I mean, that is just... <laughs> what are you doing, Charles? Uh, nothing, darling. <laughs> are you bringing worms in? I wrote a little bit of piano. So this is... <laughs> That is the, and this is why I love the, uh, and go, it's this bit where you can, you can interrogate the world and sometimes very small squares of the world, you can interrogate that world. And Richard Feynman, you know, his, his example is these beautiful stories of like Richard Feynman, the Nobel Prize winning physicist, when, when he went round, uh, when well, he went to CERN, CERN of course, a remarkable place, and uh, where you're know, partly created as well as to discover things about why our universe is as it is, but also to unite scientists from across the world. This was an important part 
part of it, how ideas can unite people, right? Feynman, though, he was being taken around and he was being shown all of the, the incredible machines uh, that lie within CERN. This was actually before the, the LHC, but of course the many, you know, the colliders, etc. And he's being shown around and they get to one particular room and this man goes, ah, Professor Feynman, this one will interest you a great deal because this is looking at the possible interaction of CERN. And they stopped. He went, I'm so sorry, Professor Feynman. I've just realised I'm explaining something you know because this machine is trying to prove your theory. And he said, how much did it cost? He said, eight million pounds. He said, what? Didn't you believe me? <laughs> and that's, that's the kind of, you know, that's the extreme. The, um, so, very quickly, because I know we're running out of the... Uh, let's see what I wanted to... The, um, the bu -bu 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 -bu. Oh, this was just a lovely thing where, again, a little Richard Dawkins story, where uh, once when he was on uh, Infinite uh, Monkey Cage, which even he finds a bit facetious, uh, he... Uh, <laughs> he um, it, it was when Richard Dawkins... There'd been a story in the... I think it was Daily Telegraph. Yeah, well, yeah, it was the Daily Telegraph. And uh, there was a story which was about the fact that some of Richard Dawkins' ancestors had been slave owners. And uh, it was kind of like going, oh, that's interesting, isn't it? It's interesting, because he's a scientist. You know, all, but he actually, you know, go back just 300 years and it turns out some of his distant relatives were slave owners. Mm -hmm. And uh, so before the gig, uh, for, for the recording, he was being rung up quite a lot. And he, and he picked up the phone at one point and he went, well, well I, well, no. Well, obviously not. No, I mean, that's ridiculous. I... No, I... <sighs> Look, I'm doing a radio show. I'll have to go. Goodbye. I said, who was that, Richard? He, sa he said, that was the journalist who wrote the piece about some of my ancestors being slave owners. And he said, Richard Dawkins, do you ever worry you might have the slave owner gene? <laughs> he said, I didn't know what to say. <laughs> And I said, well, what you should have said was, well, of course, my ancestors who owned slaves were Christians. But since we've been atheists, we've owned hardly any slaves at all. <laughs> and, and he went, no, but that wouldn't be... Oh, I see. Ha-ha. <laughs> so, that's what I love about academics. Very often they go, no, that would be like... Oh, ha-ha, I see. <laughs> the, uh, I believe the punchline could have been more rigorous. Thank you. <laughs> the... Uh, <laughs> This is... Uh, shall I t I'd see if I... I'll tell the sex toy story and I'll see if I can get to the other... Uh, actually, I'll tell you another couple of Feynman stories and then... Because they are... There's so many beautiful... I'm sure you... You know, most of you are probably aware of it. If, if you're not, go on YouTube, first of all, and just, just put in Richard Feynman and you will see there's such a beautiful selection. Many of them uh, made by a wonderful filmmaker called uh, Christopher Sykes. And, uh, and they're just... They're really interesting to see how this man was able to communicate and, and the ideas that he had and, and his delight in, in questioning the world. Uh, but one of my favourite ones was uh, his sister, Joan, uh, younger sister, was um, uh, an ex... Well, well, basically what happened was, when they were still quite young, but Richard Feynman was already getting a little bit of a reputation as, uh, as a physicist, but, but she was pretty much a child really then, they saw the Aurora Borealis. And that night, they made a deal. And the deal was that Richard Feynman could have the whole of the rest of the universe, but the Aurora Borealis, that was Joan's and only Joan's, right? And they kept that deal. In fact, Joan, who's still alive, uh, she is uh, a great expert on the Aurora Borealis. And there's a lovely story that once he was going around an observatory, I think it was near Tokyo, and uh, the head of the observatory started to ask whether... He said, to, oh, oh uh, Professor Feynman, we wonder... We're currently doing this research into the Aurora Borealis, and we just... And he said, stop, stop, stop. He said, no. He said, whatever you say, uh, I can't. He said, I am not allowed to look at, to examine, to scrutinise, to in any way think about the Aurora Borealis without my sister Joan's permission first. And he went, really? He went, yeah. He went, All right. Two weeks later, the head of the observatory happens to be talking to Joan. And he goes, Joan, is it right that Richard is not allowed in any way to examine, scrutinise, question or study the Aurora Borealis? without your permission first. She said, I'll give you both the answers you require, and they are, yes, it is, and no, he can't. <laughs> and I just... <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, do look up her work as well. And it's just, and that's and that's one of the things. That, that there's various different. I mean, almost the point of apocryphal, but I don't think they are. About also when he died, there was one of the things about Richard Feynman was he really again. If, if you've not seen much of his stuff and his lectures, there's lectures up there from the 1960s and him talking about what the scientific method is. And and he is a great. He was one of the great communicators. He really and and as, as I remember Christopher Sykes saying to me, he said, "Watch the way his hands move." 
watch the way, and you do, you see that, you know, I, I wave my hands around quite a lot, and uh, which annoys some of the people who've commented under my TEDx talks. Thanks very much <laughs> for that bit of input, but it's what I am, and fuck you. And, uh, <laughs> But Richard Feynman is very specific with his hands. If you watch it, when he is talking about, for instance, the movements of subatomic particles, when he is talking uh, about the nature of quantum electrodynamics, he's very often also drawing diagrams, of course, famous for the Feynman diagrams, but his hands are doing all the time these little tiny diagrams. And when he was very, very ill, and uh, and I would highly recommend if you look, Christopher Sykes, uh, the last documentary he did, The Quest for Tanatuva, oh, is it Tuva and Buster? I can't remember, I think Quest for Tanatuva. Uh, he, you see footage of Richard Feynman playing the bongos. It's one of the first things that will come up if you search for it in, in YouTube or anything like that. And you see a man who, within a few days, well, I think about three days later, he's back in hospital where he died. He's a man who is, is, is as close to death, but playing the bongos like a madman. It is one of the most beautiful things of seeing that zeal and lust for life. And when he was uh, in hospital for the final time, uh, uh, he got weaker and weaker, and um, he then got to the point where one day he actually he said to uh, his his wife and and to Joan he said um, would you give me permission to die he said I need your permission to die and they both went off and they they thought about it for and they talked about it and they thought well he is he's extremely weak and he's fought this now for almost the whole of his, his life in the 1980s and should he in any way be able to survive he would be so depleted but he really is and they felt yes we can go in without guilt and say, Richard, we give you permission to die. And they went and said, Richard, we give you permission. And he, and he thanked them. And then he thanked the, the doctors, the oncologists, the nurses, the specialists. He said, look, thank you for everything you've done. And I'm really sorry that I'm not going to make it this time. You've done incredible work. And I was almost sorry that I've let you down. And then he appeared to get weaker and weaker. And he appeared, some of them said, oh, he's in a coma now. And Joan said, no, he's not. He said, look, he said when there are people around him, when he can hear voices, see the way his hands are moving, that even now, even though now he is not in any way uh, actually verbalizing, he's still communicating. He's still trying to communicate as he's getting sicker and sicker and weaker and weaker. And then there's just, the base, they got to the point they thought, well, he's never going to talk again, though. But there he's still... And then one day they're both around the bed and he opened his eyes and he looks at them and uh, they kind of look back and they, they think, oh, this is, you know, we weren't expecting to see Richard's eyes in, you know. And, uh, and then he started to, to talk. He started to open his mouth and they thought he's going to say, you know, what's he? And, then, and they leaned forward and he looked at them and he went, oh, I'm glad I've only got to do this once. Dying's boring. <laughs> and the, there's various different versions of what exactly those words are, but there is that beautiful thing of seeing... Like, there's, a, there's a, a film that I've talked about many times called Young at Heart, and Young at Heart is one of my favourite documentaries of all time. It is about uh, the Young at Heart chorus. If you don't know them, they're an octogenarian, nonagenarian choir, and they sing brilliant songs by kind of you know, sonic youth and songs by talking heads and songs by The Clash. And it's not just novelty. They really... It's not like... You're it's like in an Adam Sandler movie. <laughs> Do you see the bit where the old lady sings, should I stay or should I go, and then break dances? Ha, <laughs> ha, it's real proper fucking foot. You know, there's a real, again, a chutzpah. That's what's in it, right? And they're, they're brilliant. And the documentary is beautiful. Uh, but, of course, because the people are very old in the choir, during the documentary there are those people who, who get ill. In fact, one of the most beautiful moments in the film is they all go out to play a prison. And uh, just before they go there, the guy, they don't film this bit, but the, 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 the conductor, the choir master, has to go on the bus and say that one of the people, one of the choirs died. And at the end, they, they all, they've sang these beautiful songs. They started off with a Bruce Springsteen, and they end by singing uh, Bob Dylan's Forever Young, just with their hands up like that, moving towards all the prisoners there. And it's just fantastically beautiful. But when one of the guys we think is going to die, and uh, you get kind of, there's, you know, the documentary follows the fact that they won't expect he's suddenly become very, very ill. And then after a week, it turns out that they're really not expecting it, but he's got better. And he goes into the choir, and this guy's like Harry Shearer. He even looks like Harry Shearer. goes, great news, everyone. Uh, Bob, who we thought was going to die, has uh, actually, he's just suddenly recovered. And the doctors say he should be back with us in a couple of weeks. So that's, uh, that's fantastic news. We really thought he was going to die. And uh, I know some of you have nearly died. Uh, Ted, you've nearly died, haven't you? Yes, I have. I, I have nearly died. I, uh, I don't want to do that again, but I, I presume I'll have to. I, uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Carrie, Carrie, you've nearly died, haven't you? I have nearly died. I have, yes. It was, oh, it was absolutely awful. Was that? And he goes, uh, Emma, you have died, haven't you? And she goes, yes, I have. Yes, I have. 
I was dead for three minutes. And he goes, did you see the light? And she says, I didn't look. And I just think that's a really, really beautiful. Uh, so I was going to... I just we, We're nearly at, at, at the end. And uh, the... Uh, so the, the... There's a lovely thing as well where the, I think it was Michael Gove or, or it might be Michael Gove or similar. My closest escape recently, by the way, was I was having breakfast with Brian Cox in a hotel in Manchester and thought, I only need some toast. Left early. What a relief! Because then George Osborne arrived. Hello, Brian. Nice to meet you. And everyone had to shake his hand, except for me. And thus, untainted. <laughs> anyway, imagine that. A day where I go into the Lovell telescope, but I've also shaken the hand. That doesn't feel like the kind of hand that would hold on to the outside of the ISS. Anyway, <laughs> let me shake you like I dreamt I was going to shake David Attenborough. Anyway, so... Uh, his knees still haven't come off. Leave me alone until they're loose. Anyway, so... Uh, wasn't expecting to be able to reincorporate, but that kind of thing happens. So, um, so the other... As, as I said, this, this, these are all extras. This is... Uh, um, this, this, this was one of my favourite things. I never... I, I, every week I meant to talk about this, which was um, Niels Bohr. Niels Bohr, uh, the great physicist Niels Bohr. Uh, his, uh, basically, uh, a, a, a academy, if you want to call it, his research institute in Copenhagen, uh, which was researching into ideas, quantum ideas, quantum mechanics, etc. His research institute was actually sponsored by Carlsberg. This is true. Carlsberg Beer sponsored Niels Bohr's institute. And, of course, the incredible thing is, before they did that, their advertising slogan was, Carlsberg, best lager in the world. Then they started working with him, probably. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's one of my favourites. It really is. The, uh, happy hacking. That's a great. What is, by the way, can I just say I've been impressed by many of your T-shirts. The uh, I have a silver shamrock T-shirt at the moment from uh, Halloween Three. Yeah, yeah. It's not just an act. Uh, so uh, this is uh, what else? I'll see if see what other. Oh, well, I'll tell you what. Sorry. Yeah, because this is uh, as I said. Yeah, this is just. Uh, sometimes I just have the, his note. Wittgenstein wanted to make language clear as a window pane, but no one could understand what he was talking about. Wittgenstein's brother and the rhino in the room. So, uh, <laughs> that was... Have I ever filmed that? I don't know. I, had to, I, I, I was trying to understand Wittgenstein for many years, and, uh, and I did find him really interesting to read, but I realised, again, I have no depth of understanding. And uh, there's, there's an incredible story... Oh, I can't tell you that one. The, uh, but there's... Uh, I mean, not because it's too... Uh, better not tell him that, because I would imagine that the Wittgenstein estate will find it too racy. And uh, sometimes he went to see cowboy movies and then had a very hot bath. It's true. And uh, th those were his joys, cowboy movies and scolding himself. There we are. And uh, th 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 this story about... Uh, uh, Bertrand Russell and, and Wittgenstein were very close friends initially. When, 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 when Wittgenstein went to university, when Bertrand Russell met him, he really did think this guy is in a total... He didn't even have to do most of the work that the other... He kind of was allowed to just do his, his own thing. And he really thought, this man has one of the most incredible minds. And then he started to get a little bit annoyed because when it got onto ideas of certainty... And, of course, Bertrand Russell, one of the reasons he'd eventually given up mathematics was because he had hoped that you would get to a point where you go, but this is certain. And he realised that even mathematics could not give him the certainty required and thus moved on to philosophy. And they once had this argument where, uh, basically, the, uh, Wittgenstein said, how do we know there's not a rhinoceros in this room? And Bertrand Russell went, well, we do. It's not a big room. We'd notice. It's, a, it's my study. If there was a rhinoceros, even a baby one, eventually we'd... He goes, no, but how do we know for certain that there is not a rhinoceros in this room? And... Wittgenstein went on about this so much that eventually Bertrand Russell, you know, the, 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 the very delicate, you know, Bertrand Russell, delicate campaign, but, but, you know, look, think of his, that kind of aristocratic face, was on all fours crawling around his study, lifting up the curtains, pulling open the drawers, moving the desk and going, look, there's no rhinoceros, right? He's going, look, I, under the desk, look behind the curtain, I'm pulling up the carpet, I've pulled the tacks out now, ow, ow, right, look, there, there's no rhinoceros. And Wittgenstein, after all of this, went, yes, but how do we know for certain? <laughs> and the tragedy of that story is all the time there was an elephant in the corner of the room going, no one ever sees me. <laughs> so, um... <laughs> so, 
So this is that. It probably is where I have to uh, leave you. The, uh, the oh, the other thing. Well, the, uh, sorry, this is. Uh, it's really got. I should have just done one page, shouldn't I? Uh, <laughs> this was one idea that I never got to work properly, which I was like, which, which is, I like to imagine the Cambrian explosion like being a volcano full of muppets, and I just think. <laughs> Uh, the um, the event horizon the uh, the uh, this is I always get this as well this happens in real shows where I do about three hours and then there's just a bit where my brain goes just stop they want you to stop we can't make some of them were almost sentences but now it's too erratic and you have a system like Jimmy Carr <laughs> Because I wasn't made in Alan Turing's dream. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what I was... Uh, two things... I'm going to end on a little reading, but I, uh, I never did that. I had this routine right, which I, I, I can't remember. It took me two weeks to get it right, and then for about six months of touring, it worked, and then I stopped doing it. And I, it involved... Basically, I had this bit at the beginning of a show that I did uh, a year and a half ago, which was me arguing over what is the fruit of science, the apple or the banana, right? And my argument was that it was the apple, right? And the reason being that, uh, for it, first of all, the reason it's not the banana is because the banana is used by intelligent design proponents <laughs> to explain that there must be a god. And I'm sure you may well have seen this. There is a wonderful clip on the internet of a man basically going, the banana, the banana, the banana proves there must be a god. Let's look at the banana. First of all, notice the shape of the banana. Notice how it's perfectly designed to fit in the hand. Look at that. <laughs> Perfectly designed, it fits in the hand. Unlike the apple. Oh. <laughs> and then he has this bit where he goes, notice how it has a ring pull. A ring pull, right? And then he goes, and notice how it's perfectly shaped to fit in the mouth. Apple, apple, right? And so that, that was argument part one. Then argument part two was that it was uh, an apple that fell on the head of Isaac Newton, uh, not a banana. And that if it had been a banana, one, because he was a lifelong virgin, uh, he might have been distracted uh, from just by the shape and gone, oh, and not thought... And secondly, he'd have only understood gravity from if he'd actually slipped over a banana and then been all cross about it. And then the third bit was something about how the apple is more often than not used as the fruit of the tree of knowledge, but never the banana. Uh, because the banana's too Freudian, and if you add a serpent to that... But I can't remember how that bit went. <laughs> so... Uh, but I then had this, this bit which I... I years ago, I, I was... Again, another argument I had with someone, which was that brilliant story of uh, the, the, the bed and breakfast that uh, were appalled when they found out that uh, a couple that had been booked in uh, were actually a same-sex couple. And it was two men. I, remember, I don't remember this story. And there was this story where it's like they, they, uh, they arrived, it was like, kind of, oh, my God! But, yeah! Not a man and a lady! Ah! You know, this whole thing that's like kind of there. We can't let you in, it's against our. Oh, imagine if we allow two men to share a room together. Ooh, they'll be rubbing our potpourri all over their naked bodies. Imagine what they'll do with our tea and coffee making facilities. <laughs> and, uh, the, uh, and I, that idea, and I was fascinated because I argued with a few people about that, and I think most people, you know, of, of all different backgrounds, and I, certainly the majority of Christians I've met as well, they really don't care. It's just, well, what a load of rubbish that anyone should use their religion as an alibi for something like that. But I just, as I read about it, I thought, the idea that in any way a bed and breakfast... I mean, if you've been to... It's not a sex place, is it, bed and breakfast, generally? If you've, I don't know how many you've been to, but as someone who's travelled, like, for 25 years, there's so, you shouldn't have sex in a bed... No-one has sex in a bed and breakfast, then, because, like, like, one, it's somebody else's house, right? And two, more often than not, it's somebody quite creepy's house as well. So it's like, kind of... <laughs> Welcome to our house. It's your house as well for the weekend, isn't it? Do you like dead owls? <laughs> and, uh, and I ended up having this long argument with someone who was going, but it's not their fault, it's a phobia. It's a proper illness. And I went, it's not a phobia. I said, it's not homophobia versus arachnophobia, right? <laughs> homophobia is not, it's not like kind of, uh, my, uh, my Keith, he's very homophobic. And uh, we only had it diagnosed quite recently. And uh, we were listening to the Jeremy Vine show. That was the first telltale sign. And uh, suddenly Jeremy Vine put on uh, Say Hello wave goodbye by soft cell and Keith suddenly got very hot and he said he didn't feel very well and he was a bit shaky and they started crying and they just leapt on the kitchen table and started shouting and screaming so he's got it very very severely and I said but that you know arachnophobia is not gonna I don't like spiders it's not natural is it it's not natural what spiders do making webs no I don't like spiders 
I think it's because you want to be a spider. Fuck off. <laughs> the, um... <laughs> so, uh, even the extras there isn't enough time for. So there, it's going to be... Uh, there, was, there was lots of other things that I would like... But I will I'll finish just by... I, will, I wanted to read... Uh, I'm going to read a little bit. Have I got um, five minutes? Yeah. No, OK. <laughs> <laughs> Jill, we can do that other extra anyway. It just needs me sitting in a chair uh, with a dead funny book. This is... Uh, instead, I'll read this. I don't know what the, how the copyright thing works on this. I'm just going to read one of my favourite bits of Richard Feynman. Uh, not a sad bit, a, a happy bit. And this is just, again, about being able to look at the world and question the world. And uh, he, it, sometimes this is laid out as a poem, sometimes just a piece of prose. Uh, so this... Richard Feynman. This just starts... So for instance, I stand at the seashore alone. And I start to think, there are the rushing waves, mountains of molecules, each stupidly minding its own business, trillions apart, yet forming white surf in unison. Ages on ages, before any eyes could see, year after year, thunderously pounding the shore as now. For whom? For what? On a dead planet with no life to entertain. Never at rest tortured by energy wasted prodigiously by the sun poured into space, a might makes the sea roar. Deep in the sea, all molecules repeat the patterns of one another till complex new ones are formed. They make others like themselves and a new dance starts. Growing in size and complexity, living things, masses of atoms, DNA, protein, dancing a pattern ever more intricate. Out of the cradle, onto dry land, here it is, standing. Atoms with consciousness, matter with curiosity, stands at the sea, wonders at wondering. I, a universe of atoms, an atom in the universe. Thank you very much for coming down to my DVD extra. Uh, we might have to do it as a second disc of <laughs> failure. Two discs of grand failure, 46 years in the making. And uh, so thank you very much for coming down. And I know you've got, you've got three fantastic uh, shows uh, coming. They are actually proper the show shows. You, you get, in fact, I mean, judge them a lot more harshly than you judge me. Because <laughs> you have to remember this. This is a guy dicking around, you know, just doing it for, for, the, for the extras. But this is, like, the best thing that they've ever achieved. <laughs> so really go into it going, you know, that's... Uh, <laughs> I, I also have I have three copies of Dead Funny. If anyone wants uh, wants to buy a signed copy, because then it means I don't have it in my rucksack for when I go and see McCormick and Butler tonight, and, uh, which I'm very much looking forward to. Um, thank you very much for coming along. I'll probably just be sitting on the end of it. Thank you very much for listening to my extras. Have a wonderful Go Fast Strike Festival. Thank you very much to Chris and everyone else. Bye bye. <laughs>